Uh, thanks very much, Rod, and good afternoon, everybody. I, uh, I have to say I do feel quite privileged to be considered amongst this group of people um, who are talking to you today, and thank you so much to everybody for coming along. Um, I've given this talk a, a few times over the last nine months, um, but never in under 15 minutes, so I'm about to set myself a personal record. Um, and I am going to apologise as I do for most of my talks because there is one slide of some biochemistry in there. Um, but on feedback I've received from some of the recorded audios, I, I keep making it more simple as I give it. Um, look, I also declare at the beginning of this, when I talk on this topic that I've come at it as a metabolic researcher and not as a cancer researcher. And that might be particularly important um, depending upon who's listening to it. Uh, my metabolic research is focused mainly on how diet influences <laughs> fuel storage and regulation. Um, and uh, in particular, I started looking at high fat diets. I then moved in the last few years looking at high sugar diets. And more and more, as I was doing my literature searches and designing my studies, I kept coming up across these associations between weight gain, obesity, hyperinsulinemia, and incidence of cancer. Um, and so, as it does, you start finding yourself getting pulled into a rabbit hole and getting more fascinated with an area, and, and that's where I am at the moment. Um, so we called this one Bench to Bedside because uh, a lot of feedback I've gotten has been a lot of people talk about what's been shown in mouse studies or in cell studies, um, but not so much in what happens in real life practice. And so what I'd like to do for the time that I've got is give you a little bit of a background to the rationale as to why people think about uh, particularly sugar and cancer growth, um, and then give you a little bit of an insight to some of the case studies that have been published that are in the literature that are relatively freely accessible to get, so that if people are wondering about how they can develop it and, and experiment or uh, think about it, you can go and get those references. Okay, so the rationale, this is, I guess, the summary of the rationale. Um, if nothing else, uh, you could take these three points home. There's at least three mechanisms worthy of considering if somebody is wondering should we question carbohydrate intake with respect to how it might influence cancer growth. And these are formulated over roughly a hundred years of research um, which has been sporadic at, at best. Uh, in the first instance there's an, there's an association or at least an identification of the role of glucose as a fuel source providing energy for the cell to grow. But then cells need more than energy to grow, they need to accumulate biomass, and in actual fact there's good evidence to show that glucose is a fundamental building block for that biomass. And then separate to how glucose may be influencing the inside met metabolics of the cell, there's another big argument, and that is that insulin and other growth factor hormones can drive cell growth, and we know that glucose intake or carbohydrate intake is the most potent stimulator of insulin secretion and insulin regulation. So, what I want to try and do is I'm going to give you a picture to help you maybe visualise those three aspects. Um, but if nothing else, there is the next slide in three simple points to be able to take home. Um, this is a representative cell. It's going to be a normal cell. It's going to be any typical cell at the moment, except for a red blood cell. And that's because I'm going to bring in a component that red blood cells don't have at the moment. So let's just assume this is any cell other than a red blood cell. We've got a cell membrane which consists of fat and phosphate bound to each other. So it's a phospholipid bilayer that acts as a barrier from things outside the cell to inside the cell. And so only things that have a specific transporter can get inside the cell. And all of our cells will include a particular glucose transporter. Now if we're looking at it from an energy perspective, then the very most likely first path that glucose will go into is glycolysis. And glycolysis is a relatively uh, simple cascade, and it just breaks glucose down into this thing called pyruvate, and we get a little bit of energy. Now if this was a typical cell, in typical conditions where we've got plenty of oxygen, then there's compartments within our cells, other than red blood cells, called mitochondria, and they'll utilise oxygen, go through oxidative phosphorylation, and convert that pyruvate into more energy. And I'm trying to identify by using my caps lock key there that we get more energy if we use the mitochondria than if we just left the pyruvate in the cytosol. Okay? Um, now, what we know either from exercise science work or from other cell work is that if the mitochondria has a maximal capacity at which it can work. Right? So if we are though producing pyruvate quicker than which the mitochondria can remove it, then the pyruvate doesn't have to go into the mitochondria. We have one other pathway for it. It gets converted into lactate. Now that doesn't necessarily mean we get any more energy, but what it does is it makes sure we remove the pyruvate so we can continually go through glycolysis. 
Okay, so about a hundred, almost 100 years ago, Otto Warburg made an observation in a number of cancer cells. And what that observation was that despite the presence of oxygen being quite freely available, certain cancer cells tend to make lots and lots and lots and lots of lactate, hundreds times more than you would see in a normal cell. And on the basis of what his, sorry, what his experiments showed was that was mostly because these cancer cells were utilising glucose as their predominant energy source. And so what we saw there was despite there being oxygen, that we would use glucose through this glycolytic pathway to make lots of energy, even knowing that there might have been mitochondria available. Now, almost 100 years ago, the assumption was that the mitochondria were defective in some way. Um, however, there's lots of people that have shown in various cancer types that you can still see the Warburg effect even with functioning mitochondria. Um, there's also contention as to whether or not the Warburg effect is a consistent feature of cancer, depending upon who you read and what you read, it's associated with up to anywhere between 60 to 90 percent of cancer types. So it might not be present in all of them, but it's definitely present in some. But this would only be a, uh, a problem for us if energy was the only thing that a cell needs to grow. But it doesn't need energy, it needs to convert that energy into something. And it's converting that energy into biomass. And for that we have this alternative pathway, which is called the pentose phosphate pathway. Um, now in this instance what we have is glucose going through an alternative pathway to glycolysis and it's, the end products are this thing called ribose 5-phosphate and NADPH. Now what we do with those is we use those to make DNA and we use those to make fat, amongst other things. And what is it that a continually replicating cancerous cell needs? It needs lots of DNA and it needs lots of fat to make lots of new cell membranes. And so many people have shown that independent of glycolysis, glucose is a great fuel source for the pentose phosphate pathway to allow cancer cells to accumulate the biomass it needs to grow. Now this also only makes the assumption that the only thing important is energy and accumulating biomass. But cells don't just replicate if you give them a lot of nutrients. If we take those cells and we look at them in the context of our whole body physiology, they need other signals for, to tell them what to do. And for that we've got hormones and cell signals. So as well as having transporters on our plasma membrane to allow things in, we have these receptors down here that act as lines of communication. So uh, insulin, which we've heard a fair bit of floating around in our blood, is telling cells to do various things. Now insulin doesn't actually go into the cell and make things happen. It will typically react with its individual receptor here and that will set off a cascade. And what we've been able to identify is in many cells, and, and in particular, especially in cancer cells, is that insulin act activation of its receptor has direct influences on all of these processes. It can alter mitochondrial regulation, it can increase glycolytic rate, it can influence cell growth through the pentose phosphate pathway. And so here we have the three rationales for why we'd be concerned about glucose or, or carbohydrates in general when it comes to cancer growth. We've got the energy effect. So this is where I usually in my lectures go. So for anybody who's already tuned out, come back in because I'm going to summarise <laughs> my slide in the next 30 seconds. My students give me the exact same response. There's like a sigh of relief usually. <laughs> all right. So all I'm saying is the three reasons why we should consider carbohydrate intake as something to be concerned about if we're thinking about cancer cell growth is one, there is very good evidence to show that many cancer types predominantly use glucose as their fuel source for energy. Two, we also use glucose within this pathway to make the biomass needed to make new cells. And we could, I mean, we can also use fructose for that. But thirdly, glucose or blood glucose is highly significant in regulating our insulin secretion and plasma insulin values. Now this becomes particularly important when we start thinking about the translation from bench to bedside or from what we see in the labs to what people report in clinical trials. The assumption here on the first two is, oh, well, that's great, let's just starve cells of glucose and do they die? And people have shown, yes, if you starve cells in a test tube of glucose, they do, do, do die. They don't die because they run out of energy, though. They die for other reasons. But as quite a few people point out, we can't starve our cells of glucose. You go on a low carbohydrate, high fat ketogenic diet and you'll reach a bottom, a, a floor of your blood glucose. It might sit anywhere between three or four. You're never going to run out to zero glucose. So you're always going to have some floating around. But what you do by going on a low carbohydrate, ketogenic, high fat diet 
is you avoid this. Every time, as Tim said this morning, every time you eat, you stimulate insulin secretion and an elevation in blood glucose. Every time you eat carbohydrate, that is. So by reducing your carbohydrate intake or the frequency of it, you actually avoid these individual spikes in glucose and insulin that you would have every single day. So it's not so much of trying to starve your cells within your body of glucose because you're never going to deplete your body of glucose. But what you are doing is you're minimising the windows of opportunity every day in which you have a spike in glucose and a spike in insulin that may stimulate further growth. And that is uh, at the core of one of the case studies that I wanted to spend a little bit more time on than the others. And that is uh, this one published just a couple of years ago. Now I'm going to pick on this one in particular because what I like about them is not only have they published their results, but uh, six years ago they published their, their trial, their protocol. And so if anybody wants to have a look at the diet that they recommended, the parameters of who they looked in, um, how they recruited their participants, both of those papers together will give you the complete story, whereas a lot of uh, case studies might just fit it in within the space constraints that they've got. Okay, so in this study, what did they actually get to do? They had 10 patients um, and they put them on a four-week prospective intervention. So a few things to notice, there's only 10 people, it is a small group, um, and it was a mix of cancers. So a couple of breast cancers, uh, one or two colorectal cancers, and then an esophagus, a fallopian, a lung, and an ovary. Now, so also what's important to note here is that the results, I mean, it's such a small sample size as 10 in itself, but individual cancers as well, we're not going to try and extrapolate and go, well, if it works in one cancer, it's going to work in all. And that's why we need to be careful when we use these things like case studies. But what did they have? The protocol was to set total energy from carbohydrates at 5%. And across the 10 individuals that they had in their study, there was a, a wide variance in the amount of total energy that was coming in, anywhere between 724 up to almost 2,500 kilocalories. So when we look at the individual total carbohydrate intakes for the 10 individuals, the smallest intake for one individual was 11 grams of carbohydrate a day, and the most that one individual ate was 49 grams of carbohydrate in a day. Uh, in essence, their simple rules were no bread, no pasta, no rice, no potato, remove sugary drinks, and you're not eating dessert anymore. Uh, you can eat beef, poultry, pork, fish, eggs, cheeses, and all the leafy green vegetables that you want, up to the 5% of your energy. So uh, what did they have a look at? The people that, uh, the, of the 10 people in their study, there was a range of ketosis that came in. So, what they identified over the four week period that they had, four individuals, they had progressive disease, four, they had stable disease in the one month period, and one ended a partial remission. Um, you'll notice that four plus four plus one is nine, and we started off with 10. They had another individual who uh, refused all forms of treatment for their cancer over a 14 year period. So they didn't have any baseline data to go back to for their interim. So they removed that one when we were discussing the um, progression. Um, so when they have a look at the individual data sets and then do some grouping, what they identified was the four, uh, well, so the four stable and one partial remission. If you compare their blood ketone body increase compared to the four that um, had progressive disease, compared to baseline, those who reached a stable or partial remission had 17-fold increase in ketosis versus those who um, had the progressive disease, it was only a five-fold increase. What they also showed was that the higher the ketosis uh, in their individual, it was more likely associated with the lower insulin. So they referred to this as an insulin inhibitory dietary protocol for trying to uh, help manage um, cancer treatment. So what we have here is, um, now, sorry, I should also point out that the main focus of this study, though, that the, uh, the authors identify is a feasibility and a safety protocol. And what they identify is that the, all of the participants within the study uh, tolerated the diet well um, and complied quite well. But there are a few limitations that we need to identify when you have a look at the case study. All groups, every individual lost weight um, and that was around about 4% and in their protocol they had a threshold if, they, if anybody lost 5% body weight they'd remove them out of the protocol. So nobody reached that threshold but they were close to it. But it also suggests that we need to consider People who are considering using this program need to consider what influence that might have in Kakechia and what have you. Um, everybody decreased caloric intake by about 35% and that was the spontaneous um, on the ketotic diet. So 
that may or may not be a bad thing, but what that does do for the results is it doesn't allow the authors to identify, well, how much of the effect was because of caloric restriction, which has been shown to have a benefit for cancer tumour growth, versus specifically the ketones that were floating around. Um, and another limitation that the authors like to point out is that their measure of progression was using this mechanism or this method by which they measure transport of glucose and utilisation within the cancer cell. So while that's a good indicator of glucose utilisation by the cell, it doesn't necessarily indicate other vulnerabilities of the biology of that cancer cell. So one could use alternative measures. Um, however, that study there, because of the information that it provides, is an excellent starting point for people to go and have a look at what is the regime, what is the protocol that one might be able to interested to engage. It's not the only case study that's published, and this very messy slide gives you some of the other more highly cited and referred to case studies of individuals that have used ketotic diets or ketosis diets in their management of cancer. And that's another thing that I should point out, is that almost all of these trials, the individuals are still undergoing their standard therapy. So it is not using diet to replace standard therapy. It is using diet as an assistant and as a, a, an adjunct to your standard therapy to see if you can improve efficiencies. Um, and so we've got some early, I put these up to identify that within the literature that is available, there is a huge variance in the design and the model. And so if you have a look at the, uh, the 1995 paper, they're using a particular type of uh, uh, medium chain triglyceride oil diet. Um, they have got 770 calories per day, another patient on over 2,000. Um, what we have here in the Zookley paper is they've, just, they've grouped carbohydrate and protein together and it's an only an eight week period. Um, the Schmidt paper, 70 grams, and then the Colin Champ paper, 30 to 50 grams. Um, so really being able to utilise the current evidence base to design a protocol, uh, while we don't have an established one, there is at least a growing evidence base that can be used. Um, and I should point out the Schmidt and the Champ paper, they also give the description of what their dietary program was and what their instructions to the authors were. So once again, if you're looking for what has been trialled before and how it's been incorporated, as well as the fine papers, Schmidt and Champ and the others. Um, another thing to identify that with the current evidence base, there is a dominant representation of the central nervous system tumours. And that might be a carryover by the fact that many people talk about just how more susceptible brain cells may be to a ketosis state as opposed to other cells within the body. Okay, so in conclusion, I just wanted to make sure that we've got some major points, and I've just gone a minute over, I apologise, Rod. Um, so if we're looking for explaining a rationale as to why one should be concerned or thinking about the role of carbohydrates within cancer treatment, there's three good reasons why. That is, we use glucose as an energy source within cancer cells. We use glucose as a fundamental building block for those cancer cells. But we also know glucose will influence insulin, and insulin is a potent stimulator for cell growth. And so therefore, there's at least three reasons why we should be. Where are we with the current state of play? There are very few human published studies on clinical trials or case studies, but it's a building group. Um, there are a few studies that are currently registered clinical trials that are underway. Um, and a, a part of the issue that people talk about is convincing institutional review boards that it's okay to engage in such a practice. Um, I put here that many of the diets report, uh, many of the studies report that the diets are well tolerated. Um, but I should point out that at least one of the studies screened people beforehand. So they removed people who weren't going to tolerate the diet. So there might be a little bit of inflation in the group diets that are rather well tolerated. But the other important thing to really note here, all of the case studies discuss and put it in the context that we're not talking about diet replacing treatment, but diet being utilised. And mostly because when, uh, when a lot of people talk about the treatment options for cancer, very little attention has been paid to specific macronutrient content for diets. But uh, I'm done. Yeah.